Okay, guys, and now we'll get into the systematic analysis. We've covered the basics of intervals and the basics of waveforms that we should see. Now we'll get into like, how do we interpret what we see in the ECG? So the first thing that we wanna do when we're looking at an ECG um, is look at the rate, right? So how fast is the, you know, is the heart beating, right? And to do that, we look at the R to R intervals. And we'll show you a tip on how to do that in a little bit. The rhythm, right? We're also gonna look at the R to R intervals. Are they regular or are they irregular? Right, so are we seeing you know our our intervals that are happening in a consistent fashion? Again, we can maybe a small box here or there, one millimeter difference. Um, you know, nothing substantial though. It should be in a regular fashion. And then, are you know, is there a AP wave before every QRS uh, complex? Right, meaning that you know if we see a P wave, that's fair to assume that that probably started in the SA node, causing atrial depolarization. And if it comes before QRS complex in the subsequent, you know, subsequent manner, it means that the means that the QRS, the ventricles, are being controlled by the SA node. The SA node is setting the pace. That's a good thing. Do the P waves look alike? Right? Are they funky looking? Is there you know P wave proceeding? You know every QRS. So is there we see one in each cycle and is it before each cycle? Is the PR interval within normal limits? And we can get into you know. Is the QRS duration within normal limits? And again, we know that should be very short, at most three small boxes or 0.12 seconds. And then does the rhythm come from the SA node, the AV node, or the ventricles? Now, like I mentioned, if we see a normal looking P wave before every QRS, right? If we see a normal looking P wave before every QRS, and we'll get you know, a little T wave. Right, we can say, yeah, that's, that looks like a normal, you know, that's normal, right? Means that the SA node is controlling, you know, what's happening downstream in the ventricles. Um, however, there may be some situations, right, where we don't see a P wave and we've got, you know, a, you know, st a still a narrow, normal looking QRS complex, and then we have our T wave. Now, Anytime the QRS complex is narrow and normal looking, right, that means this QRS started somewhere, it originated somewhere above the ventricles, meaning there's some structure above the ventricles um, controlling the activity in the ventricles. That's, that's not that's a, you know, a good scenario generally. If we see a P wave, that means, you know, before with a narrow QRS, that means that started above the ventricles and started specifically in the SA node, right? That's a good thing, that's, that's normal. If we just see a narrow QRS, but no P wave, started somewhere in the atria, we would call that supraventricular, meaning that the beat, the ECG, the rhythm that we're seeing started above the ventricles. It, if we don't see a P wave, it didn't start in the SA node, but it started somewhere up there in the atria. Maybe it was the AV node, maybe it was the junctional tissue, um, you know, somewhere above the ventricles, but it's not originating um, in the SA node because there's no P wave, right? So we call that superventricular. If the QRS is wide, right? We'll just draw like a, a Mach 1 here, it's super wide right, you know, by, by example. That is an example of a, of a ventricle that started somewhere in the ventricles. Remembering if the QRS complex is narrow, started somewhere above the ventricles. If it's wide and often kind of weird looking, that started in the ventricles, that could be an ectopic pacemaker. Remember those little gremlins basically that can you know, sometimes find their way to, into the conduction system. But this one started in the ventricles, um, so the ventricle, somewhere something's causing the ventricles to spontaneously discharge. That didn't start at a at a higher structure in the atria or the SA node. If we used to see a wide looking QRS complex, that didn't start down there. But if it's narrow, normal looking, started above the ventricles. If there is a P wave, it probably started in the SA node. If it's narrow, but there is no P wave, it started somewhere above the ventricles. We call it superventricular. Um, but if there's no P wave, we can't say it's sinus or starting in the SA node. And then is the 
Atrial rate uh, matched the ventricular. Again, these should be one to one and P wave to the ventricles. But probably the most important thing to bear in mind is what is the hemodynamic consequence? Maybe we lose a, a beat, right? Or maybe things are prolonged or we have abnormalities in, in, in multiple different uh, ways. Um, what's the hemodynamic consequence, right? It, you know, are we, is it, are we gonna be able to effectively deliver blood downstream, right? Maybe we lose uh, the SA, you know, we lose atrial depolarization and thus atrial contraction. Um, maybe we lose that atrial kick. For a younger person, maybe not as you know significant in terms of exercise capacity, ability to move and symptoms they may have, but in an older individual, maybe it is, right? So, um, or if the heart rate's moving a mile a minute, that also may can, you know, lead to some, uh, some complications too. So um, the, again, the, probably the first thing that we always wanna look at just from a quick scan is the heart rate. How fast is our heart um, beating? Because that translates to how hard the heart is working. Now, there are a couple different methods to, to uh, approach this. Uh, the first one I'll teach you is the 300 method. Easiest way to remember this is, um, again, between you know using these thick lines. So one thick line removed from a R wave represents you know, a heart rate of 300. So if our QRS complex, the next one landed here, that would represent a heartbeat, right? A heart rate of 300 beats per minute. Subsequently, if it landed here, two thick lines away, that would represent a heartbeat of 150 beats per minute. Landed four away, sorry, three away. So one, two, three away, 100 beats per minute. Uh, if it landed one, two, three, four, 75 beats per minute, and then five, again, that represents one second. Remember five, this is all 0.2 seconds. Represents 60 beats per minute. And if it's six, that actually represents 50 beats per minute. Again, 0.12 times, um, doing, doing a little bit of math there. And we can calculate this out by just doing a little bit of basic math, right? So. If this falls here, right, remember this rem is, represents an interval of 0.2 seconds, right? So this would meaning that we have a beat, right, occurring every 0.2 seconds, right? Every 0.2 seconds, right, there is, um, you know, a beat. So again, we've got a beat every point, point 0.2 seconds. And let me get my uh, little uh, uh, pen here. So 0.2 seconds, there is one beat and... Now, apologies for the math not looking super clean here, but there's one beat every 0.2 seconds. Right? If we want to look at what that looks like over a minute, we'll multiply this by you know, 60 seconds per minute. Um, 60 seconds per minute. Right? So we end up getting 60 over 0.2. Right? Which represents 300 beats per minute. Same thing, if we do 60 over 0.4 equals um, 150, right? So just a little bit of basic math by extending out how frequent, the, frequent these beats occur every, um, you know, every, every subsequent beat and extending that over a minute to give us beats per minute, which is how we, the unit that we use to calculate heart rate, right? So. That's basically how this little math works. And that's why it, like the, the ECG paper is so useful because we can get a pretty good estimation of heart rate by just looking at you know, where these things fall. Well, the question that we'll get often asked is, well, what do you do, right? Like if that doesn't exactly fall, you know, what if we do if that doesn't exactly fall on you know, one of these thick lines where we can do that just quick mental math? Well, a couple different things. Right, a couple different things. Let me get my, there's a couple things we can do. My pen. So um, again, these are all based off of units of time, right? So this represents this distance here, this, you know, this, this distance here represents a, a, a difference of 150 beats per minute, right? If you think about it. And you can do the math if you, if you really wanted to. But it represents a difference of 150. This represents a distance, 
difference of 50, 25, and we're subtracting 300 from 150, 150 from 100, 100 from 75, 75 by 60 is 15, and this is 10. And that is not clear. One five, two five, and that's five zero, and that's one fifty. This means that every single box or thick line represents, if we divide that by five, right? Every five boxes in, in this interval represents a difference of thirty beats per minute. Right? So if it lands here, right, for a second beat, you know, if we start here, we're counting from here to here, if, it, if the second R wave is there, that represents, this interval would represent a heart rate of 180 beats per minute. Because right? we're counting 30 plus 150. If the, you know, if the heart rate lands, for example, here, Second one, let's clean this up a little bit. We just said that this represents a difference of 50, right? And there's five, again, small boxes between every large box. So this represents, every box here represents 10 beats per minute. So if it if we start here and our second R wave lands here, which is one, two, you know, and we're now in our, you know, three, or two and three small boxes away, we'd count up or count down by ten. So we count up from ten here. So this would be 110, 120, or 150, 130, 1, uh, 150, 140, 130, 120. Either way, we're we're, we're counting units of ten. So this would represent a heart rate of 120 beats per minute, right? Because just again, doing a little bit of mental math. And then so on and so forth, right? If it lands here, again, this is a difference of 25. This represents, a, uh, you know, each small box would be five beats per minute, you know, per small box. If it landed here, that would represent a heart rate of 80. If it landed here, it would represent a heart rate of 95. And again, you can calculate this out. So it's a quick and dirty way of, of assessing heart rate by just using a little bit of math, remembering these intervals, or if you just wanted to do some quick mental math and just remembering 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and then just calculating every thick box. If you, if, you, if you forget that too, if you want to go all the way back to the math, or we can just remember the rule 300, 150, 175, 60. I would really recommend remembering this for a couple of reasons. So again, you can look at this and calculate and get into the nitty gritty. Why this is useful, and again, it goes back to why it's so helpful that, you know, ECG paper is standardized so we can make inferences because we know the interval of time and we can do a quick calculation that we know, you know, that these, these, these timestamps exist, right? If, there, if one lane's here, the heart rate's 150. This becomes especially helpful when we're just trying to determine is this heart rate tachycardic or bradycardic, right? So if, if we look at a heart, an ECG and the second, the ardor Rs are less than one, two, three, right? If it's less than three large boxes, um, if it's less than three large boxes, between RR intervals, that heart rate's tachycardic. It's above 100, right? If it's below, right, or if it's longer than one, two, three, four, five large boxes, that heart rate is bradycardic, right? So if it's greater than five large boxes, right, that's bradycardic. So even without getting out in specifics, you know, and trying to calculate the specific heart rate, I can say, okay, well, this is less than three. This heart rate's running a little fast. It's, it's tachycardic. It's over 100 beats per minute. Or I can see, oh, well, it's, it's beyond five, right? We're at six large boxes. This heart rate's actually running kind of slow, right? Um, and if it's anywhere between three and five, 
in this range here, that's the sweet spot. That's where heart rate should normally be at rest. Um, and if you want to even get deeper into the weeds, heart rates at rest above 150 did not come from the SA node, came from somewhere else. So at rest, if the heart rate above 150 at rest, that's not probably coming from the SA node. So just from looking very, very quickly at the this rhythm strip, I can calculate heart rate almost you know, just from looking at the large boxes and remembering those intervals. So that's why it's very, very useful. This ECG paper being standardized makes things so much simpler. The other method, and it's just another example, again, of this of this interval method, right? So we just kind of talked about that. So again, you know, this example here, zero, you know, and 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, and then 50, right? So this one fell a little bit beyond that. So again, it's looking at our quick inference, one, two, three, four, five, Right, so we said anything, you know, beyond five is a heart rate below 60, and we know that here is a heart rate of 50. This represents an interval of two, so 60 minus two, right? Two because we have, for one small box away equals a heart rate of 58. And because we can just look at it and tell from looking at it, knowing that this is bradycardic, because it fell outside of one, two, three, four, five large boxes. So we know that's it took longer than one second for that second beat to occur. Easy way to remember it too. So it's a little bit of mental math. And then the other way we can look at this is the second method. Because you might ask, well, it, what if our RR intervals aren't consistent? And that's absolutely possible. That does happen clinically. So the second method, and by no pun, pun intended, uh, the second method uh, is the second method I will teach you, but it uses time. Um, so in this example, we're just gonna count the number of QRS complexes, specifically the R, wave comp R waves, in an interval of time or seconds, right? So remembering that five, right, five, large boxes equals an interval, right, of one second, right? And then uh, 60, uh, sorry, 30 large boxes would represent an interval of six seconds. So 30 large boxes, large boxes equals six seconds, right? And again, because it's five times 0.2 times six. This is why most ECG rhythm strips just automatically have that built-in three-second tick, so I can look at six seconds pretty easily. So in this example, let's count it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. All right. So, and we'll count the number of beats that occur in this 30 seconds. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight QRS complexes in an interval of 60 seconds, or six seconds. If we extend that out to 60 seconds or one minute, that gives us a heart rate of 80 beats per minute. So we did eight, or we have it already here, eight QRS complexes um, in a six second interval extending out, out, out to 60 seconds or one minute would give us a heart rate of 80 beats per minute. Uh, this gets very useful when the rhythm is irregular and, you know, because the, the, the 300 method requires the R to R intervals to be consistent, right? At least three of them to be consistent. Because um, you know, if our R to R intervals are so variable every subsequent beat, there's no way that we can really extend this calculation out for what happens over the minute. Um, so for this, you know, second method, it becomes very useful for that because we can calculate heart rate even if our R to R intervals are inconsistent or irregular. So the second method, very useful. Um, and often is what is used clinically because uh, we often have those three second tick marks above the paper. Now, I always exercise a little bit of caution. Sometimes 
papers don't actually use three second ticks just you know but uh always confirm make sure that those tick marks are exactly at three seconds before you make your inference um and now the rhythm and again the rhythm we talk about that we, we should see r to r intervals consistent if the r to r intervals are inconsistent right that would indicate there's some sort of irregularity um now there may be some you know, uh, variable patterns where there's a dropout where the R to R intervals are prolonged, but it happens in a consistent fashion. Um, there may also be some periods where the R to R intervals are inconsistent and don't follow any regular pattern, right? So some exa examples of a, what we call a regularly irregular, right? You know, maybe the R waves get longer and longer apart before reverting back to normal. Or there may be some examples where in, in an irregular, irregular fashion, where there is a, you know, irregularity in the R to R interval, but does not follow any pattern, right? So it's abnormal, but it doesn't follow a consistent pattern. And we'll cover some conditions where that happens. So um, long story short, this is what we should look at and see every single, you know, hopefully, hopefully see every single time we look at someone's ECG at rest. Again, we should see that nice and narrow looking uh, QRS complex, right? Meaning that, that that started somewhere above the ventricles. If there's a P wave before it, that's probably started the, that this rhythm started somewhere in the, started in the SA node specifically. Um, we should see a heart rate between 60 to 100. And again, we can make a quick inference of that by just looking at our our intervals here. So let's do a quick one. We know just looking one, two, three, we're in between that, that, that um, normal range. This one's, you know, in a, in a normal, normal rate. If it's a little bit more than three. Are the R to R intervals consistent? We can eyeball this. This is roughly about, you know, three and a half apart each time. So that's pretty consistent across the board, meaning the beats are happening in a consistent manner. Is a PR interval nice um, and narrow looking? Again, this looks to be less than 0.2 seconds, which is great. Is a QR interval nice and narrow looking? That looks normal. So everything checks out here. So again, S sinus a rhythm, sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm just means we've got a normal looking P wave followed by a narrow, normal narrow looking QRS complex at a heart rate that is normal 60 to 100 and all the other intervals check out. That is normal sinus rhythm, meaning that the SA node is controlling the rhythm and the rate is at a, you know, that normal range of 60 to 100 at rest. And it's an example here of what you would see on a 12 lead ECG, right? So we got lead one, lead two, we've got lead three here. Again, remembering lead two is gonna look a little bit bigger sometimes and uh, lead lead one or lead three, depending on the orientation of the heart. And then again, that R wave progression, looking and seeing again, how these R waves kind of move in, in direction of each other and they get bigger as we move across uh, the ventricles um, or across the, the unipolar leads. And then we've got AVF, AVL, and again, AVR, our orphan lead. You might get a little you know freaked out by seeing this T wave here, but remembering it's in the same direction as the R wave because these things are inverted. This would be an example of an irregular rhythm, right? So we've got more than one P wave before a QRS, or we'll go over what that means. So again, QRS complex looks normal. Um, you know, it's narrow, but there's too many P waves. Remember, there should be a single P wave before every QRS complex. We got two P waves, that's not normal. And you might ask, well, what is, how do you know that's a P wave, not a T wave? Again, P waves follow that typical morphology. We see what it looks like here. This looks like, looks like another P wave. Um, and this is our T wave here, a little bit longer um, manner. And then we got another example of an irregular rhythm. We don't even really see discernible P waves and it's an irregular rhythm as well. Look at our R to R intervals all over the place, right? So unlike this example where our irregularity happens pretty consistently, even though we see multiple P waves here, we see a pro, you know, the intervals are still pretty consistent, right? The irregularity is consistent. This would be an, this would be a regular irregularity. This would be an example of an irregular irregularity, right? So we see these, you know, R to R's are all over the place. The irregular, the irregularity happens in an irregular fashion. 
So we another example of a, an irregular rhythm here. So um, this, again, looking at, you know, we, we don't really see discernible P waves. Uh, the QRS complexes are kind of mucked up too. So um, these are some examples of things that look a little bit abnormal. Uh, so quick comment on um, the left, left atria and ventricle hypertrophy. We're not gonna get too deep into this, but left atrial enlargement can happen uh, sometimes in certain conditions where the P waves are just a little bit larger. Um, we'd see the peak amplitude above three. And then left ventricle hypertrophy, there are some conditions where this uh, occurs. We're not gonna cover too much into this. There are some specific criteria. It's uh, an S wave in V1 or V2, um, uh, plus the R wave in V5 or V6. This is our S wave here. Um, greater than 35 millimeters. That would indicate a um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Again, if the ventricles are larger, the amplitude is going to be a little bit bigger. So, um, so that is our brief review as to systematic analysis. Now we'll get into some specific conditions.